my goal in the next 40 minutes or so will be to get to the deeper ideas in the book, Telling Our Way to the Sea. And those are ideas not only about ecology, but also about storytelling. So I'll be dipping into the, the book now and then to, to read a little bit to you. And that's actually how I'd like to start. Let me just plunge right in. A school of needlefish parts to stream around me, and I find myself momentarily among the silver traces of a comet shower. I move to join them, but they accelerate and dissolve into open water, leaving me to stare at the luminous molten mirror that is the underside of the ocean surface. Veronica taps my arm, a signal that says both, look at that and be right back, as she slips from the roiled layer of silver and descends swiftly like a being born underwater. Her skin diver's fins form a single broad fluke, which propels her neoprene form sinuously toward the rocky bottom. Bright bubbles escaping her snorkel wobble urgently back to the air above. A thousand times I have seen her descend like this, yet still I find myself wondering if, this time, she might go too deep or stay too long. Here, mercifully, the sea floor is only 20 feet down, a depth at which the plunging shoots of sunlight are just converging to their vanishing point. As she approaches the rocks, Veronica twists, glides to a supine and weightless pause, and gazes up at the students who float beside me here at the surface. She seems to be pointing at something on the sea floor. Allie, the student to my right, turns to look at me. Inside the partial shade of her dive mask, her eyes are hard to read. They look puzzled, a little concerned. She's probably just wondering why Veronica wants them to notice what appears to be a mud-brown lump of sea muck though it also seems possible that Allie has already perceived Veronica's tendencies underwater, the strange private gravity that seems to draw her to depth, and she is now asking in her gentle way whether something should perhaps be done to bring Veronica back to the surface. I take several long breaths, saturating my blood with oxygen and preparing to dive, but just as I draw my last deep dose of air, Veronica finally relents. She places her hand gently around the nondescript mound and pulls it from the rocks holding it as one might hold a soft loaf of bread. Arriving among us, Veronica holds out her hand, upon which rests her inert quarry. What was mud-colored below is now, in this bright, shallow water, more of a yellow ochre, and it is studded with pale tubercles that are almost the color of lemon drops. The skin, stretched taut over the knobby body, appears thin and mucosal, making the thing look terribly exposed like a bodily organ drawn by the hand of a surgeon into the sudden brightness of the operating theater. The students, there are five of them here, draw in around Veronica's palm, peering intently through their panes of tempered glass. They seem transfixed, certain that Veronica's plunge must have been for something thrilling. The lump trembles, inches forward along Veronica's palm. Suddenly it is less vegetable than animal, and the students pull back apprehensively, but as the circle of masks starts to widen, Veronica's free hand catches Allie by the wrist. Veronica is wise, I think, to choose Allie, because there are others who might not be so trusting. Carefully, she opens Allie's palm and holds it beside her own. As the knobby creature slides from one hand to the other, Allie's eyes widen and she speaks into her snorkel, an incomprehensible but richly expressive string of syllables. For a moment, she seems frozen, but even in her astonishment, she looks to the other students. She takes the hand of the young man floating beside her, opens his palm, and holds it next to her own. The animal slides over obligingly, and as it does, Cameron explores the creature's back with his other hand. Cameron's hands look muscular, well-worn, and they sometimes move in unusual ways. The fingers seem to explore independently, executing many minor adjustments as if they were navigating the neck of a string instrument. These hands have learned to perceive more than other hands because Cameron cannot see. He is blind, and as his fingers creep across the animal's back investigating, it becomes clear that they are following a pattern. The yellow warts, which at first seem to be scattered more or less randomly, are in fact arranged, loosely but nonetheless perceptibly, into two rows. I have never noticed this rough regularity, but now that I see it, I suspect it might be meaningful. I suspect, in fact, that those two haphazard rows are clues to a deep connection. 
an invisible but very real thread that links the ugly animal on Cameron's hand to far more beautiful creatures we've seen this morning. Just moments before her plunge, Veronica pointed us to a sun star, Heliaster cubinagi, a pink and green starfish in the unmistakable shape of a sunflower. And before that, we all hovered in admiration over the crowned sea urchin, Centrostephanus coronatus, which is a sphere of long and slender spines, each one perfectly black but for the occasional sharp wave of blue light that races from tip to base. To describe these scattered pulses to Cameron, Ali said it looked like an alien's brain. So the connection that those little bumps on the back of the animal that Cameron discovered revealed was uh, membership in the phylum Echinodermata. Now what that really means is that that little ugly animal and those more beautiful creatures we'd seen earlier that day on the dive uh, are all descended from a single species, a single ur echinoderm, you could say, that inhabited the oceans 520 million years ago. That ur echinoderm, in its time on Earth, uh, hit upon some terrific inventions, evolutionary innovations, basically. And those inventions were passed down to the various animals that now belong to this group, echinodermata. The tubercles on the animal's back bespeak one of those, but another one, and what Cameron wanted to show them now, uh, is something called mutable connective tissue. And I need to sort of tell you how mutable connective tissue works so that you understand the next part of the story. Mutable connective tissue is a, it's really just collagen, the stuff that makes up the, the cartilage in your knees and the, the discs in your spine and like that makes your nose kind of stiff. But whereas our collagen stays relatively hard all the time, uh, echinoderms have an amazing ability to change the nature of their, their collagen. Collagen is a polymer, meaning it's, it's built up of many, many copies of the same little molecule that link together. You could think of, you could imagine um, twist ties that you wind together into something like a suspension bridge cable. That's what a collagen fiber is. It's basically twist ties wound into a suspension bridge cable. Now, what echinoderms can do, thanks to little cells embedded in their collagen, is they, they, those little cells release a, a compound, and it causes the suspension bridge cable to immediately fall apart into billions of twist ties. At the level of the animal, that looks like something that is hard, like billiard ball hard, one moment, going, putting soft. It basically liquefies itself. More amazingly, what the animal can do is those cells uh, secrete an antidote to the first compound. The twist ties then quickly rewind themselves into the suspension bridge cable. And that animal that was liquefying itself becomes billiard ball hard. This is what uh, Veronica, who brought the, the cucumber up to the surface, wanted to show the students. Now, when the, by the time she decided to demonstrate the, the properties of mutable connective tissue, the animal had been passed around the students and was now resting on the hands of a student named Anoop. And Anoop um, was, was game, but he wasn't quite as comfortable in the water as all the other students. So he's holding this creature and um, just barely managing to keep his chin above water. Uh, at the moment that Veronica decides that she's going to show us what mutable connective tissue can do. At the moment, the most pressing mystery is why Veronica would take a noop of all people as her volunteer for a magic trick with mutable connective tissue. Given that we will try this only once in our two-week course, I don't see why she would make a noop the one whose nerves will be tested. Does she think his excitability will enhance the shock of transformation? Or has she really put him on my watch, allowing herself to forget her own warnings? In any case, when she places her snorkel in her mouth and puts her face in the water, all of us follow suit, except Anoop. With the animal stranded on his trembling hands, he is unable to replace his snorkel and is left alone above water while everyone watches his hands below. Through my half-submerged mask, I keep a watchful eye on Anoop's face. At first, he looks somewhat resigned, like a surgical patient separated from the doctor's work by a curtain across his chest. But a second later, he whips his head suddenly to the side, trying to catch his snorkel's mouthpiece with his teeth. He makes three such lunges, each of them unsuccessful, before he gives up, takes a deep breath, and submerges his face. 
just in time to see Veronica's index finger pressing on the animal's back. The creature compresses instantly, but Anoop holds steady. Veronica places Cameron's hand on the frozen animal, and the other students, too, feel the hardness of cross-linked collagen. As Anoop watches their hands reaching in to investigate, his cheeks begin to swell with the pressure of unexhaled breath, and just when it appears they might burst open, admitting a gasp of seawater, Allie reaches across our circle and places a noop snorkel in his mouth. Through his glinting mask, he seems to look gratefully at her. Veronica begins to rub the animal's back, and at first it appears to relax. But then something goes wrong. The creature skips liquefaction and moves straight to more drastic measures, the last line of defense. Because an echinoderm's nervous system speaks directly to those special cells embedded in the collagen matrix, telling them when to release their potent catalyst of change, the animal can freeze or liquefy whichever piece of tissue it needs to. This is how a brittle star caught by the arm can throw off the entire limb, leaving it behind like the detached tail of a lizard. It simply liquefies the narrow segment of tissue that connects the arm to the central disc. And when a cucumber is under attack, it resorts to an even more radical tactic. It swiftly disassembles the collagen cables that holds its organs, violently contracts its entire body wall, and shoots its viscera out its anus. One can imagine that even the most menacing predator might be taken aback by such a move. And even if it weren't, it might at least be tricked into pursuing the evacuated innards instead of the now hollow cucumber. Taking a bite of floating viscera, the predator would quickly learn that the animal is laced with a powerful toxin. The hollow cucumber, meanwhile, would have moved on and would later regenerate from stem cells in its empty body cavity a complete set of internal organs. But if evisceration might distract a menacing predator just think what it could do to Anoop. When the dark purple organs explode from the animal's posterior, he startles and flails, attempting to back away quickly. The guts purl and twist in his turbulence, forming a kinetic design of dark ribbons, diffusing colors, and loose round forms at the center of our circle. From the bottom of this turning mobile, the cucumber body sinks toward the seafloor. <clears throat> so later that same day, uh, I was sitting on the terrace of the Vermilion Sea Field Station. And those same students, those same five students were gathered at the, at the other edge of the terrace. And they were kind of reliving their moment with the cucumber. Anoop was reenacting the whole thing, and they were all laughing. At a moment in which they fell silent, Cameron, the, the blind young man, uh, turned in my direction and, and yelled, hey, why doesn't something just eat that thing? I didn't know how he knew he was how he knew I was there, but I picked up my chair and walked over and sat with them. And for the next two hours or so, we just talked about the sea cucumber. We we talked first about holothurin, that that toxin that that I mentioned, lacing the animal, um, and how it's now serving as a model for uh, chemotherapy drugs. And we talked about the East Asian market for, for cucumber. There's a, there's a large uh, fishery for cucumbers, actually. And then eventually, the, the cucumber led us into pretty deep evolutionary questions about recapitulation, the idea that the development of an individual organism recapitulates the forms of that organism's ancestor through time, from ancient ancestor to, to present animal. So without getting into any of those conversations, I just kind of want to take a step back and observe what was happening there, because that's, that's really what the book is about. What was happening there, I think, is that we had taken uh, an animal as the starting point for storytelling. And we allowed ourselves to be digressive. We talked about um, its poisons. We talked about its markets. We talked about its evolution, its ecology. and. At the end of that long conversation, there was another pause in which Cameron sur summed up what had happened in that conversation. He was a, he was a surfer. He, he was from uh, Santa Barbara, so he talked like a surfer. And he said in that moment, do you realize that this entire gnarly conversation started with that knobby thing that puked on a noob? And it sounds funny, but it's, it stuck with me. And the reason it stuck with me is that it, it struck me as the solution to a problem, the answer to a question that, that has occurred to me often uh, in many different places, certainly in Bahia de Los Angeles. Here's the question. 
why are we uh, such dismal stewards of the natural world? Why is it that place after place, sea after sea, landscape after landscape, we overfish the sea, deforest the landscape to an extent that it's very difficult to bring it back? What is it about us that makes us so bad at taking care of the natural world? And I think there are two, there were two sort of deeper answers to this question. And Cameron's funny line is a, is a, is a part of a solution. The first answer, I think, is that we have a problem of memory. We actually don't remember what those seas or landscapes looked like long ago. And lacking a vivid memory of, of their grandeur, we also are without a motivation to restore them to their former state. I, I can kind of illustrate this with uh, the sea cucumber, this problem of memory. The first time I was in uh, the Sea of Cortez, Veronica brought uh, the same animal, a sea cucumber, up for us to look at. And I'd never seen one, seen a big one before. I'd been diving a lot, but never seen this, this exotic animal. And so I took it as a sign of the bay's, the bay's richness. I, I suspected, ah, I've never seen this thing before anywhere else. That must mean that this bay where we are right now is relatively untouched. In fact, as I learned later, I could have taken it as a testament to the extent to which the, the bay's been scoured. Veronica explained that the year before, a couple years before, she'd been sitting on that same terrace and had watched as boat after boat returned across the bay, piled high with brown sea cucumbers. And that one season of extraction changed the, the Bay of LA from a place where sea cucumbers could be found about one every square meter or so to a place where finding one was a special occasion, an occasion to gather the students and talk about this strange creature. The point is that I misread that moment. I, lacking a memory of a, a, a bay rich with sea cucumbers, it didn't occur to me that, in fact, what I was seeing was a, was, was a small remnant of what was once there. And you could say that's because I'm not local to Bahia de Los Angeles, which I'm not. But there are also, there's an entire generation of inhabitants of Bahia de Los Angeles who also have never seen a rocky reef rich with sea cucumbers. For them, too, this is the state of nature. And in fact, for each generation, there is a new state of nature. Each of us takes the wildest place we've ever seen and thinks of it as, as wilderness, like the place we saw in our childhood, the place we saw in that nature documentary. We think, ah, ah, now that is really nature. But we're wrong. That's not really nature. In fact, nature was something much richer than that. Fisheries managers refer to the problem of a, a shifting baseline, which, which means that each generation of fishery manager has his own baseline expectation of what the, the, the sea can yield. But because each generation inherits a slightly degraded sea, there's this process of generational decay in our idea of the sea. It, you could also say, well, Maybe it's just because that sea cucumber is an ugly little thing, and who's really going to notice its, its absence? But when I started looking into this as a, as a problem, it was clear that the same phenomenon of drifting expectations had occurred with every other charismatic creature I could find. Around the Sea of Cortez, there's a correlation between the age of a fisherman and his estimate of how large a fish can grow for, for an, any number of species of fish. So for example, if you ask a 70-year-old fisherman, how big does a yellowtail get? The answer is hmm, four and a half, five feet. If you ask a 30-year-old fisherman, the answer is three and a half, four feet. And it's not you know, what's the biggest one you've ever seen. It's how big can they get? There's a different idea of what the sea can do. Or another example, the word uh, mantaraya. Older fishermen use the word mantaraya to refer to manta birostris, which is an animal that grows to about 25 feet across. It's, I mean, you know what a manta ray looks like, right? It's that thing with the big black wings and the long stingray tail. 
Mantaraya to an, to an older fisherman is, is, is that animal, Manta birostris. To a younger person in Bahia de Los Angeles, Mantaraya actually refers to a different set of species because they've never seen Manta birostris. They've seen much smaller species that are about four or five feet across, members of the genus Mobula. For them, Mantaraya means that. The older fisherman has a different word for that thing, the smaller thing, but that word isn't used by the younger people. So even, even the language has changed. The, the, the word mantaraya sigma, sig, now signifies something smaller than what it used to signify. It's not, it's not always something disappearing or shrinking. Sometimes it's actually something arriving. So the, the biggest fishery in the Sea of Cortez right now is the Humboldt squid. It's about a four-foot animal that looks like, you know, like, a, like the calamari you eat, but it's huge. And that animal didn't show up in the Sea of Cortez until about 1974, when fishermen removed so many large fish, predatory fish like tuna, yellowtail, which is, that, which is what you think of as hamachi, um, mackerel. They took out so many of those that the Humboldt squid moved in as the new dominant predator. And there it has stayed ever since. So for anyone under the age of mm, 30 or 40, in the Sea of Cortez, the Sea of Cortez is full of Humboldt squid. They don't remember a Sea of Cortez that was instead full of, of large fish. So why did Cameron's line strike me as a solution to this problem? When you take a creature as the starting point for your storytelling, and you allow yourself to be digressive, you nearly automatically begin to reconstruct a vision of what the ecosystem once was. The reason it happens is that the, the stories essentially serve to connect one, one creature to another. And as you follow them outwards, you come to something that's now missing in the Sea of Cortez. There's an interesting metaphor for this, these kind of connections, that, for which I'd like to turn to, uh, to Henry David Thoreau, actually. So this is Thoreau. I take infinite pains to know all the phenomena of the spring, thinking that I have here the entire poem. And then, to my chagrin, I hear that it is but an imperfect copy that I possess and have read, that my ancestors had torn out many of the first leaves and grandest passages and mutilated it in many places. I should not like to think that some demigod had come before me and picked out some of the best stars. I wish to know an entire heaven and an entire earth. Let me just keep reading for a moment. Over the past 10 years on the bay, I have tried to gather up scraps torn from the poem. I've collected them from Veronica, from her mentor Lane, from the turtle man Antonio, from the wandering drama critic Crutch, and from many others. With my hands full of ragged bits and scraps, I might be inclined to believe that the bay has been more severely rifled, more drastically abridged than other places I've lived or visited, but the opposite is true. In the bay, many passages were lost so recently that people I knew could recite them, and the poem, paired and slashed though it was, remained sufficiently coherent to betray certain gaps. In other places I've been, so much was lost and lost so long ago that there are hardly reminders of the poem's former content. Who on the eastern seaboard is struck by the absence of migrating gray whales, or nesting sea turtles, or playful and clever sea mink, or river frothing runs of salmon and eel? Yet they were all there, and there in great abundance. We live amid the wreckage, yet we hardly notice that something has changed. When we were sitting there on the terrace, talking about the sea, cu sea cucumber, we were sort of reciting the extended poem of Isisdicapus fuscus, the brown sea cucumber. And when you do that, you, you follow those digressive tales 
and run into the tears in, in the fabric, the ecological fabric. Or to take Thoreau's metaphor, imagine you're looking at the sky and you see the Big Dipper there, but one star is missing. You notice, right? If you're looking at the Big Dipper and the, that, that star that's at the, the front of the little ladle is gone, you're going to notice. You wouldn't notice if any other star was taken out of the sky because you don't have the shape to give you an expectation. Stories about animals are like that. You follow them from one species to another, to another, to another, and when you come to a place where one should be, you notice that it's missing. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So that manta ray, when I started looking into the history of the manta ray in Bahia, Los Angeles, the first place I found records um, was in writings of the pearl, from the pearl industry. In the, in the 16th and 17th century, there was a thriving pearl industry in the Sea of Cortez. They thought that the manta ray was the most dangerous predator of pearl divers. They thought that um, manta rays would hover above the diver, and when the diver came up, he would envelop them and devour them. The manta ray actually eats plankton. It's a filter feeder, so it was, it was a strange tale that they'd come up with. But nonetheless, whenever they saw one, they, they killed it. Reading this tale, you, the, the first thing you think is, hmm, strange idea. The second thing you think is pearl industry. There's no pearl industry in the Sea of Cortez. But in fact, the entire coastline of the Sea of Cortez was formerly covered in thick reefs of pearl oysters. Now there are lovely beaches and rocky reefs because the pearl oysters have all been removed and were removed by about 1750 or so. So there's no memory of them. But if you start thinking about the manta ray and what happened to it, you run into a couple different exotic species of pearl oyster, the rainbow pearl oyster, the black pearl oyster. So continuing forward with the manta ray, after the pearl industry collapsed, the main danger to the manta ray uh, were fishing boats. Because fishing boats, if they saw one, would, they'd try to kill a 25-foot animal because it was a lot of free meat. They'd harpoon it. But a harpoon, what is a fishing boat doing with a harpoon? Fishing boats today in the Sea of Cortez have uh, small fish traps and uh, fine gauge gill nets. Fishing boats carried harpoons because they were looking for turtles, sea turtles. There were four species of sea turtle. You never see them anymore in the Sea of Cortez. They're all four endangered species. Now, the greatest threat for the, the manta ray are the drift nets, which are placed for um, billfish, like marlin. But they also take out uh, several different species of shark. So, so you see how you can start with one animal. and tell its stories, and inevitably you encounter the other things that are gone, the pearl oysters, the four species of sea turtles, the sharks. The reason this happens for you network theorists is that the ecosystem is highly connective. It's a small world topology, essentially. When you start talking about one, one creature, the ecological or historical relationships are so reticulate that they're going to lead you out across the entire network. And that's why the process of storytelling restores to you, almost inevitably, a sense of what the sea once was. And the hope, of course, is that if that vision is compelling, we'll find a new motivation for, for making our way back there. Of course, the process can also kind of kindle some, some dismay and even despair. But here, too, I think Cameron's observation can help us. Because what are we doing when we're situating an animal in its network, in its ecological or historical web? We're really finding the meaning of that animal. We're recovering a sense of that creature's meaning and value. Because what is meaning but a connection between one entity and many others. What's meaning in a language? What's the meaning of a word? It's the connection, the, the relationships between that word and many other words. Or what's meaning in a human life? It's the connections between an individual and larger entities or other individuals. In the same way, the meaning or value of a creature is apparent when you situate it in its ecological or historical context. I mean, a, a brown sea cucumber sitting on the bottom of the ocean is, is not an obviously valuable or meaningful entity, but when it comes to the surface and you start talking about the various ways in which it, 
it makes sense, the various functions it serves, the ways it works, suddenly it becomes a really valuable creature. And I think that process can help us reconcile two visions of nature that have been in play here. On the one hand, the nature that has grandeur, the, the, the 25 foot manta ray, the, the sea turtles. On the other hand, this, the, the clear sense that this is a degraded natural world. How do we hold those together? One way we can hold them together is through this process of kind of digressive storytelling, which compels us to face nature as we contend with it today, but allows us to hold in mind at the same time a sense of what natu the natural world could be. And I want to close with a, a reading that, that speaks to that, that difficulty. One evening, I thought I'd search the internet for reports of mantas in the bay. I entered the words manta ray, Bahia de Los Angeles, and when I pressed return, I received several pages of links. For a moment, I thought the manta might be faring better than I'd believed. But as I began clicking through, glancing at snapshots, reading a line or two, it became clear that all the reports were of leaping mobula. None actually involved manta birostris. Most of the photos, however, bore captions that identified the flying creatures as manta rays. What was in the process of happening in Bahia to the word mantaraya had already happened on the internet with the term manta ray. And this struck me as a very vivid instance of the quiet, stepwise change in our idea of nature. The name of a huge species had been bequeathed to a small one. Alongside some of the mislabeled photos of Mobula munkiana were accounts of nice trips people had taken. Here are some excerpts. It's not easy to reach, but worth the journey, especially for those who value unspoiled nature more than a mint on the pillow. If Baja is one of North America's last great wildernesses, then LA Bay is Baja's crown jewel of untouched beauty. Civilization hasn't changed the place much. We go in search of wilderness, and so it is wilderness we find, and we write home about it. We tell the story of our rediscovery of nature. We compose suitably lyrical prose. We send back photos, and their iconography is just right. We hold up the large fish we've just caught. We recline on a white sandy beach. A winged ray leaps from the water. These are our dispatches from the wilderness. But when those snapshots are held up against images from the past, something is a bit off. Our fish is rather small. Or maybe it's not a fish at all but rather an enormous squid. That beach is hardly pristine. In fact, before the oysters were removed, it was not a beach at all. And that ray, it is two and a half feet across, not 25. I, too, am awestruck by the monstrous squid, lured by the beach, thrilled by the leaping ray. But how can we reconcile our sincere wonderment in the face of what natural worlds we still have with our recognition that what we are seeing is miserably dilapidated? On the one hand, a skein of rays, and on the other, the likelihood that they are but fry. We must be careful, I think, to hold on to both, not to let one wash away the other. For if we permit ourselves to indulge too thoroughly in wonderment, we will forget where we are on this long stairway downward. But if we let our sense of history overwhelm our wonderment, leaving us with nothing but blasé weariness of the unimpressive present, then we won't much care where we are. What we must do, perhaps, is cultivate our craft of seeing more than one thing at a time. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Greg. Are there any solutions to the, the jellyfish problem that you can talk about? I mean, um, the, so just so you can hear the question, are there solutions to the jellyfish problem? The jellyfish problem that he's talking about is something I've talked about before. It's um, this phenomenon that uh, as we fish our way down the marine food web, starting with the big fish 
down to the, we, we take out the big fish, then we take out the little fish. And there, again and again, it seems what replaces them, those species, uh, are jellyfish. And it's happened in a number of different ecosystems. It happened in off the coast of Namibia in the most productive water in the world. And it has happened recently in the Sea of Japan, also a big fishery, that the ecosystem is now dominated by large jellyfish, which is a problem because jellyfish, although they're eaten in East Asia, are not, um, they don't bring the same kind of price for fishermen that, that the predatory fish do. Solutions for it. Um, one, one thing that we need to try first is just to stop fishing uh, for everything else, for the large fish, for a, for a brief period of time. We haven't been able, even in fisheries that have collapsed, to, to stop altogether and let the ecosystem rebound, to see if the ecosystem might rebound. So we don't actually know if the jellyfish are maintaining their own stable place in the ecosystem by eating the young of everything else or if, if we just leave, leave the ecosystem alone, maybe everything else will come back and replace the jellyfish. So that's the first thing to try. There are a lot of kind of managerial uh, challenges to that, which I talked about a bit last night, but the, that's the first thing. The second thing, which would be more radical, is to actually try to manipulate the ecosystem actively, to engage in biomanipulation, which would mean to try to fish the jellyfish intensely and even possibly to fish um, at the same time, after we've let them rebound and seen that it doesn't work, if it doesn't work, even to fish at the same time some of the large predatory fish to see if you can bring back the forage fish, the sardines, the herring, the anchovy, that kind of thing. You could, you could try to manipulate the ecosystem, but this is a high stakes game because it can go terribly wrong. Off the coast of Namibia, there was an attempt at biomanipulation to fish anchovies hard to let sardines bounce back, and it backfired terribly. And we are left with a, the richest water in the world now occupied by um, jellyfish and bearded gobies in a kind of stinking hydrogen sulfide swamp. So, so biomanipulation can backfire badly, but in places where we've tried other things and the stakes are really high, the potential rewards are really high, it might be worth investigating. Other questions? Yeah. First of all, <clears throat> thanks for being here, and it was a great reading. Uh, in particular, I'm curious, so we talked a lot about what's to be mourned and the downside. So I guess I'm wondering, are there, are there any good results of these, uh, of these ecosystems getting drastically changed? Are there any, ups, are there any bright lights here, anything to be happy about? Uh, about the, the, the transformed ecosystems? Yeah. That's a really interesting question, um, and, it's, it, and it presents us with a, a tough decision to make as a society. So yes, there are places where the transformed ecosystem can be really valuable to people. And the most familiar one is um, off the coast of eastern Canada, Nova Scotia, that area. So you've probably heard of the collapse of cod, right? There are books about cod and, and what an incredibly important fishery it was for hundreds of years. And then it collapsed kind of once and for all in the 80s. That was devastating for a lot of um, fishing communities on the coast of Canada. But a decade later, in the absence of those large predatory cod, the populations of shrimp and crab began to expand enormously. And now, the value of the fishery for shrimp and crab is greater, not just than the value of the fishery for cod, it's greater than the value of cod, the value of the fishery of cod formerly was at its height. So now, actually, that cod are beginning to come back, thanks to protection, there's a real dilemma. You know, do we, do we manage to, to let cod back, or do we manage to keep cod out? There are many fishermen who think this would be a bad idea to reintroduce cod to the ecosystem. Um, something I talked about last night was um, the possibility of uh, privatizing ecosystems, uh, essentially turning the ecosystem over to local fishermen to give the local fishermen a chance to, to manage it. In that case, with the assistance of managers, the fishermen can decide what is it that we 
What is it that we want to fish for? What is it that we want to draw from this ecosystem? And I think their long-term interest will probably serve the ecosystem well, because they will want to, to maintain, sustain a, a income from as many different species as they can. If you can have, to some extent, income from shrimp and income from cod, you're not only going to make a lot of money, you're going to make, you're going to have a diversified portfolio, which is appealing for other reasons. That is, it's not as volatile as a portfolio consisting of one stock or one fish stock. Other questions? Great. Thank you very much.